Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is lesson number nine in the series on First and Second Thessalonians. We'll be focusing particularly on First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So we would encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along with us. And we wish you could participate in the discussion, but this time I guess you'll have to listen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it's with a great deal of appreciation that we recognize your presence with us, that we recognize that your Holy Spirit was the one behind the words that we are about to study. Help us to grasp the meaning, to discuss it meaningfully, and to share it with those who are watching and listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now that we've come to the final chapter in 1 Thessalonians, let's review just a bit. In 1 Thessalonians, the first three chapters, Paul discusses his history with the Thessalonian churches and what happened when he was there and what happened right after he left there. And he also praises them. He, he, he says, you know, I'm so thankful that you're faithful to God and you're, the, the, the evidence, the the reports about your faithfulness have spread around. So those are the first three chapters. Then in chapters four and five says, but <clears throat> there's really some issues that we need to talk about. And the last couple of times we talked about First Thessalonians 4, particularly their misunderstanding about the second coming and how soon it was going to take place and what would happen at the second coming. And now in chapter five, he's going to deal with a lot of issues, uh, briefly touching on a number of different issues. Um, Timothy had come back with news from the Thessalonians that Paul felt he needed to respond to. Um, whereas 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul primarily deals with errors as he perceived them in the beliefs of the Thessalonians. And chapter 5 is going to talk about problems in their behavior, their attitude toward others, and, and, and so forth. Especially he's going to focus on the idea that they needed to be constantly ready for the day when Jesus would come back again. So I guess the first question I want to ask all you is, two millennia later, we are reading a personal letter from Paul to a small group of Christians in a hostile environment. How does that impact us? Should we just, are we wasting our time to be reading this kind of a letter? Is it any different now than it was then? Isn't, aren't God's true people relatively small in a hostile environment? Well, in some places it sure seems like that. Uh, if you live in an Adventist ghetto somewhere, why maybe it doesn't seem quite much right. like that. <laughs> you know, a lot of the Bible is, has been written under a hostile environment. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what we're going to see in, in, in chapter 5 here particularly, he's going to talk about contrast, the good and the bad, the good and the bad, the hostile, maybe the not so hostile. In our court system, he's going to talk about being judged at first here. In our court system, why do people, uh, why are people taken to court? Just in general. They broke a law. Because they did something wrong, I, I, to put it in very broad terms. Or, okay, they so, broke or a law. someone thought they broke a law. Or perhaps, yes. Or they can't Agree on something, somebody's got to okay. so make a judgment on what's righteous. Yeah. We, in general, think of the courts in, in negative terms. If you're, if you're in, you know, you're, what's going to happen? You know, if you have to go to court, you know, because we are assuming that there's a, maybe a 50% or more chance that it's going to be bad news. You know? So in our system, it's like this. But we need to remember when we're talking about God's judgment, Everyone is going to be judged. So we certainly hope that not everybody is going to be judged badly. We hope some of us are going to get a good judgment, right? So if everybody's going to be judged, certainly there must be some positivity in there somewhere, and we're going to look for that. So what, what can we learn about God's judgment from the Bible? Are there any examples that jump out at you thinking about God's judgment of the Bible, how, how reliable it is, or 
or how maybe unexpected in some cases or something like that? The book of Job touches on that. Basically, the whole book is about God's judgment and Say uh, more. God's, uh, well, in the very beginning, there was a, Let's look at those verses. You're talking about the very beginning. There was beginning. a council in heaven, and Satan said, uh, or actually, God said to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Mm -hmm. And uh, Satan said, yeah. He just obeys you because you protect him. You put a wall around him. You do, do good things for him. Take yeah. those away, and he'll be just like the others. But just before he said all that, God said, he is, my version says, faithful and good. The King James Version says, perfect and upright. God declared he was righteous. Does that, does that, is that a judgment? Yes. It is a judgment. That's a, a one evidence of God's foreknowledge. Okay. God declared Job, uh, Job righteous. And the reason for writing the book would have been missed if he hadn't made that statement. Okay, now that's not usually the way people read the book of Job. Most I'm people sorry read sorry about that. Huh? There's hardly I'm any sorry about <laughs> that. There's hardly any Bible commentary that has it right. Yeah. At least at least it agrees with me, and okay. that is that the, the book is about God's foreknowledge. Yeah. And well, no and, and and not just about God's foreknowledge, very specifically, does does God have the capacity to look at someone and say this person can be trusted? In other words, and because why is that important? That's one of the basic attributes of the of the infinite. He can foretell the future. Okay, that the yes, that's the God. But why is it important to us that God has that capacity? Because when we get to heaven, I'm going to have complete faith. Exactly. That who's living next door to me? When God chooses who's going to be admitted to the heavenly kingdom, He better not make any mistakes, or we're back in the great controversy, right? Exactly. So. A book like Job is really important for under. Now, it's, it's there's quite a bit in there about why do the righteous suffer and all that kind of stuff, which is an important part of the overall picture. But the real picture is God, as some kid might say, it, don't make no mistakes. Okay. So it shows that God said Job's going to be a good man even when all this befalls him, and God was right. God knew Job. And you're saying that God knows each one of us if we'll have some things about us that maybe are not okay, and God will say, but I know this person mm. will be okay in heaven and uh, won't upset the apple cart again. Right. Well, now, now sometimes, though, people say this is God's judgment because some things fall on them. That's well, bad the things story of fall Job, on them. though, is helpful. There, there, but, there are but, not many of us that are expected to be examples to the universe. Okay, but, but <laughs> you know, if that's true, then it's a little confusing with Job because did he really deserve what would happen to him? Well, let, let, let's just touch on that really quickly. A lot of us have bad things happen to us. What are some of the common reasons why bad things happen to people? Number one, we do stupid things. We do stupid things or we get into bad habits. Right. Those, that's the most common thing. Secondly, we live in a dangerous world. Someone else m mashes us or someone else does some, something bad to us because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Once in a while, well, and, and then once in a while, it's just because we live in a hazardous world. It may not be anyone's fault that you stepped on a rock in the Grand Canyon and it collapsed with you or something like that, you know. Sometimes just pure accidents happen. See, did, did, you know, did you know what you were doing when you had that heart attack or whatever, you know, when you ate that pasta or whatever it happens to be, you know? Sometimes things happen that we, we don't know why they happen like that. And once in a rare, rare while, there's a story like Job where God allows him to go through an experience because something needs to be demonstrated for the universe. That is unusual. So if someone comes along and says, I'm going through a Job experience, you better say, Boy, you must be a really important person. <laughs> God's trying to demonstrate something from you, for you, through you. We, we talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. But wouldn't it be just about equally to say the, time of, the type of Job's trouble? Mm -hmm. the, they'll actually have to come to the place where though he slay me, yet will I trust him yeah. uh, the, to that same experience. Having said that about Job, 
we need to understand, we, we said this has something to do with the great controversy. Look what Satan said about Job. Turn to chapter 4, and I'm reading from my Good News Bible. Chapter 4, I'm going to start with verse 12. This was, this was, now this is one of Job's friends, but listen to what the friend says and see if you can guess who might have been behind it. Once a message came quietly, so quietly I could hardly hear it. Like a nightmare it disturbed my sleep. I trembled and shuddered. My whole body shook with fear. A light breeze, and, and that could be translated a light spirit, uh, touched my face and my hair bristled with fright. I could see something standing there. I stared but couldn't tell what it was. Then I heard a voice out of the silence. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? What's happening there? Sounds like one of Satan's charges. Yeah. An evil spirit is talking to him? Yes. And what's he suggesting? He's suggesting God misjudged Job. God doesn't have the capacity to correctly judge Job. Furthermore, Job doesn't have the capacity to stand up under what Satan's going to put him through because Satan doesn't want to believe that he doesn't want to believe that God correctly judged him. Well, he wants to say, God, you made a mistake in judge, judging Job. You made a mistake in judging me. And also he says, every single person, can anyone be righteous? Mm -hmm. Every single person there on earth is, uh, is not deserving of heaven. Well, he's just saying that, okay, I can never be judged righteous, so nobody else can either. Yeah. This is well, basically what he's saying. And, and look at what he goes on to say. God does not trust his heavenly servants. He finds fault even with his angels. I guess, I wonder which angel he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> One third of them. <laughs> Do you think he will trust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? Someone may be alive in the morning, but die on notice before evening comes. All that he has is taken away. He dies still lacking wisdom. So now we can see that God has said Job is righteous, perfect, he can be trusted, and Satan says nobody can be trusted. Ab a, a human being can be trusted? Never. See? So that's the argument. And, and what's the conclusion? Job is said of me what is right. <laughs> Job 42, and most people stop reading before they get to chapter 42. And Job 42, 7, and we have it here in our handout, in case you're interested in these handouts that we, that we come up with from time to time, uh, well, we, bring them, we produce them every week, uh, this one can be found on our website. It's at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And we're turning now to Job 42, verse 7, and really verse 8 as well. God is speaking to Eliphaz, the man who w voiced the words of Satan back in the beginning. He said, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me. This is God speaking. You did not speak the truth about me the way my servant Job did. And then he repeats it in the following verse. So, where do we go from there? Well, let me ask you the next question. Well, even yeah. under pressure, Job spoke correctly about God. And that's our task, that even under pressure, mm -hmm. we are to speak correctly about God. And even, that's why we're to learn about him before it's pressure. Time. Even under the pressure of his so-called friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The pressure, of the peer pressure that was driving his, his, him. His wife said, curse God and die. Yeah. His yeah. relative said, you stink. And his, and his family members, that some of his kids had been killed, mm -hmm. and he lost everything. And uh, you got miserable friends that, that tell you, why don't you just curse God and die? Man, alive. That, they were church people? Well, <laughs> they were his buddies. <laughs> you know, when I, when I read Job, though, uh, he was angry in a couple places. Yeah. The yeah. thing is, he just didn't lose it. Yeah. You know, he... he well, I think he probably had a reason to be angry. Yes. Yeah. You lost right. all your kids, all your wealth, didn't understand. all the everything. Your family is telling you to curse God and die. I mean, what does Job have left? Only his trust in God. Was and he Job, could, go ahead. Was Job cursing himself and no. wanted to die? No. I mean, did he say, let me die? Well, <laughs> well, yeah, he did. He, he, said, said, he said, I wish I was never born. Yeah. <coughs> so that's kind of the same thing, but still, there, there must not be anything wrong with that. 
He's a, human, he's a human being, and he adhered to biblical mandate. Even though he was angry, he didn't sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if you grew up in a Christian home where you were told about the judgment that was coming, were you comfortable with that, or were you terrified? The judgment? Anybody feel comfortable enough well, to say I, uh, I, We've been I, terrified I, enough. <laughs> I, I remember my uh, family didn't go to church, and my dad had uh, been a Catholic. And um, I remember his mother sent him the prodigal son uh, book. But anyway, I just remember seeing that when I was a girl. But he said uh, he was terrified when he was a little boy. Uh, he was so terrified that he went to get a drink of water out at, I guess, a horse trough or something out in the street, and it was so cold that uh, fog or the came out of his mouth when he breathed, and he thought the fire of hell was inside him, and he went. He said he went running down the street, and the church had scared him, huh? and he never, re he never went back. Wow. I, I just remember him telling me that. But what? Why do you think the Bible says that the second coming of Christ is going to be sudden, unexpected by most of the people, and, and of course, very final? Shouldn't God say, I'm, I'm getting ready to come, I'm getting ready to come, please get ready? He did. But we're he very has. complacent people. But he said that 2,000 years ago. That's all right. Well, that's all right. He still <laughs> said it. <laughs> I only last 75 years. Okay. My, whole, my whole existence doesn't last very long. I think somewhere in our individual lifetimes, we're all going to be given a chance to make a decision somewhere. Mm. Yeah. We'll never be able to say that we didn't have a fair shot. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God's judgment is going on at the present time. We, b we believe in a so-called pre-advent judgment. We used to call it the investigative judgment. By the way, what, what does it mean when we call it an investigative judgment? Does God need to be checking things out? Uh, what does God need to learn that he doesn't already know? Yeah. It looks like Job 1 and 2. He lays things out before everybody and says, let's consider this situation. Who, 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 who's the everybody that he lays out before? Well, the, or the all the in universe. I, I, that's what we get, the heavenly council in heaven, Job 1 and 2. Okay. But in a court system, when you're, it's an investigative judgment, the people on trial, such as the humans of this earth, are the ones usually being investigated. So uh, maybe... Uh, we need to explain what the Bible says because the Bible okay, let's, explains let's it of, differently. Let's cut, pick a couple of verses. One of the places where it talks about God's judgment is Daniel 7. And I'm going to read starting with verse 9. While I was looking, this is Daniel in vision, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothing were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There are many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were open. Now, my translation tries to put it in, in, in simple English. Um, the word for, for people there just means beings, and we would, we would say angels. Um, but who else might be watching besides the angels? Onlooking universe. The onlooking universe. Where would you read about the onlooking universe? How do I know that anything like that even exists? First Corinthians, Colossians. First Corinthians chapter four, verse nine, maybe. Right. And where else? Colossians. Colossians one. 1 19 and twenty. Ephesians. Nineteen and twenty. Ephesians one. 19, 20, Ephesians, 1, 19, 1 Ephesians three nine and ten. Even Job one and two. Job one and two. Yeah. First Peter, one twelve has a. You get yeah. a little imp. A little bit. Yeah. Okay, so there are a number of verses in the, in the Bible that, that talk about that. Um, so you're if, saying that there are other types of beings on other types of worlds in the universe, and the angels are only one type, and then the other worlds have different types, and all those people are coming to this where thrones were putting place and watching this God opening the books and the judgment beginning? Well, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes though, the, the, the judgment is on the court. 
too, you know, on the judge. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's been <laughs> some circumstances just lately where people wonder about judges mm -hmm. if um, well, they here's, judge here, correctly or not. There's a figurative side to this. As I've often wondered about this. It seems to me God's got to have some more to do than just open up some old books. And when you, yeah. the, the more telescopic range we get, the more worlds we see. There's yeah. got to be something else he's doing that's <laughs> in some ways more yeah, important I, than uh, that. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I, I'm, I spent a, a few, few hours in the last month or so looking through uh, a series that I, I purchased on what we've learned from the Hubble telescope. Exactly. Incredible. There's one person, I don't know whether, he, whether they change people every year or whatever, but at least this particular guy has the ultimate discretion. Uh, of they, they, of course, set up everything in far in advance. Okay, who's going to get permission to use this for how many minutes or how many hours to study what kind of a thing, research? I mean, of course, people are, everybody's scrambling to, to get time with the Hubble. But this man is given like 100 hours every year to, to his discretion. So the idea, basically, if, some, if somebody suddenly comes up with something imminent that's happening right now, somewhere in the universe and they want a, a supernova or something like that, then this guy has a discretion to focus on that right at that moment. He said, nope, we're going we're to stop other things, we're going to do this. Well, this guy had some hours left and he said, we're going to pick a spot. We're going to pick a spot where it looks like there's virtually nothing in space and we're going to focus on that and see what we find. And I've forgotten the exact figure, but they focused on this spot and just, you know, and that, of course that meant they, you know, that how the, the, it goes around every 90 minutes, goes around there, so it, it, would, it would focus on it and then it would come back and focus again and it kept right the same spot, the same spot, the same spot. And there's like 300 galaxies or something like that in this spot where it was well, supposed to be nothing. nothing. Yeah. yeah, incredible. So, well, look what the Bible says about that. Job 38.7. In the dawn of the, and it's talking about creation and all about how this world was created. And it says here in verse 7 In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. The stars, that's another word that's often used for Lucifer as a, as a light bearer. That's the stars. So who would the heavenly beings be? Angels. Okay. And anybody else? Well, are you saying the stars could be angels that, um, and um, the heavenly beings are the other the beings? The heavenly beings here, if you, uh, my little thing says, well, it says heavenly beings, look back at, at chapter 1, verse 6. It actually says the sons of God. All the sons of God shouted for joy. Mm -hmm. If we take that expression, we go over to Luke chapter 3. It talks about the history of Jesus and his ancestry, and it goes back and back and back and back. And finally it says that Adam was who, the son of whom? Son of God. The son of God. So is this talking about maybe other worlds around the universe that have someone like Adam that was the first person there who represents that world and they were gathered together at the court of heaven and there they are, the sons of God. Mm -hmm. See? That's Deuteronomy. a possibility. Deuteronomy 8 also refers to the sons of God. He fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, <clears throat> we believe, Seventh-day Adventists in general, believe that Gosh, the judgment is going on right now. Yes. He didn't say daughters of God, so it was just sons of God. <laughs> well, okay. We, it was a patriarchal society. Uh-huh. It's a patriarchal society. Okay. Okay. And like you said, sons of something, sons of God, sons of men, could be like a species of, mm -hmm. yeah. of, of creation. It really means descendants of, if you say sons of men, it means descendants of human beings. Mm -hmm. If you say sons of God, it means descendants of God. Mm -hmm. Whether they're male or female or not. Mm -hmm. Or neither. Yes, or neither, in which case. Okay. Well, we talked a little bit about the investigative judgment. We don't believe that God needs to investigate anything. He already knows everything he needs to know. So what's the point of having an investigative judgment? Now, in more modern times now, in fairly recent times, Adventists have come to call this the pre-Advent judgment. What would be the significance of that name? When he comes, he takes some and leaves some. That means a decision had to be made about each one. Mm -hmm. 
And it has to happen before he comes, yep. pre-advent. Yes. Well, right now, what we do is investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. We're investigating, yeah. and we're making a judgment for or against God and the way he runs his universe. So who's being convinced at this point in time about the judgment? Is it possible that our future neighbors and friends are trying to decide whether it's safe for any of us to be admitted up there? Well, I think the, our guardian angels, who's pretty close, well, has already made that judgment. <laughs> <laughs> anybody anybody going to argue with God's judgment? Well, the point, let, let's Satan talk did. about it. Satan certainly did, and a third of the angels did. And they, the other they're two, out. They're not they're up out, there. But still. <laughs> at, at the time of the cross, that settled it for the other two-thirds, my understanding would yeah. be. That, that's, that was the pivotal thing that happened in the fullness of time, First Corinthians, excuse me, Colossians and Ephesians. Mm -hmm. There. Okay. His I, I can't imagine somebody from another universe saying, you know, I'd like to look at what happened to so-and-so down on earth. And they said, oh, no, you can't look at that. You can't, you, you, you can't see that for another thousand years because we haven't got the judgment going yet. Yeah. If they wanted to know, they'd get to know. But this is a time that's set aside by God. He said, okay, if any of you have any questions, here's all the evidence spread out on the table. If any of you have any questions, because I'm about to bring some of these guys back up here. Sure. And so... It's an orderly way of doing things. God yeah. is a God of order, and it's, it's not out of character that he would do something at a particular point of ten time It's a fine teaching. way to represent it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, can, can a heavenly being say, uh, well, I don't know, God. I, I've checked Joanne's record, and I don't know if I agree with you. I, I think she shouldn't <laughs> come in here. I see. <laughs> Me, me I, I don't think that voice would be up there. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> to me, it seems this is the one time in this universe where the jury can't be bought. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, there's a very specific place in the Bible where it, it spells out in some detail exactly how the judgment takes place. And that's in John. Remember the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus? The famous verse, of course, is John 3.16, For God, so lo God loved the world so much, I'm reading my Good News Bible, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. But we should never stop there, we should read on. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged. And it's interesting, if you look at the the Greek there, it could be in the middle ver, um, middle tense as well as the past tense, meaning those who believe in the Son do not judge themselves, but those who do not believe have already judged themselves because they have not believed in God's only Son. RSV uses the term condemned. Yeah. Okay. I didn't come into the condemned, which I, I think is a little bit more distinctive. Okay. Right. Well, this is how the judgment works. Now, we want to know how the judgment works. I mean, Jesus himself is explaining. I mean, how could we go wrong on that? This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was an obedience to God. So, so how do we... So you're saying that, that um, those that believe don't get judged, but that yet those who do not believe are already judged. Condemned, I uh, like. Uh, well, well condemned. you just said that, judged, so it's almost... I think judged is a bad... <laughs> I don't like that one. <laughs> well, well isn't that what you said? Well, that's, that's, what what it, that's what it reads. That's what it that's reads. What it reads. But, but I want you to think about but what's in That might be because of your idea that you don't like that. Well, that, other, other translations <laughs> don't use the word judged, and they're looking at the same Greek word or whatever yeah. it was. Well, uh, well, still, whoever believes versus whoever doesn't believe, there's still a judgment going on there. Okay, now, but let's, let's look at the whole passage. In verse 17, it said, God did not send his son into the world to be its judge. Mm -hmm. So, there's, according to that, there's something else that, that functions as a judge. What this passage is saying is, you and I, every one of us, is judging ourselves every day by the way we live, by the way we think, yeah. by the way we 
what we see, what we do, what we hear. Every day that we are making judgments about ourselves. God, when, when the records, when the books in, are open in heaven, it's just a record of everything we've done. And the, everybody can look at it and say, yeah. And Actually, when the record is open in heaven, it's more than what we've done. It's the, it shows the motive. Yeah, sure. And the, said, those, things that, the, yeah. those things that God only can look at, yeah. are, he puts out there open for others to see. I said, every, just, our thoughts. Just a minute. What, what about the bad things in that book? I mean, it seems to say that people are either you don't have believe or you believe and you do good works. What happens if you believe and you do 50% good works and 50% bad works? Okay. And, and, and the books is open and it shows you a 50-50. Well, I mean, we, we can talk about that here uh, in oh. humans. We, humans, we do that. But God, like Norm has already pointed out, looks at the very motives. And he, the question, and, and we, should, we should replace that word believe with the word trust. God only has to answer one question. He looks at you and he said, can you be trusted to bring into heaven? If you can be trusted to take into heaven, God will take you there. Can you be trusted to look to God to give you the strength to improve that 50 to 60 percent good, to 70 percent good, to 80 percent good? Yeah. Now which one is it? Are we to trust ourselves to be trustworthy or are we to trust God? No, the only way we can improve is to trust God. Okay, but then then um, you just turn it around and says that we have to be trusted, that we would be um, yeah. safe to save. Mm -hmm. So God has to make that judgment. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it seems like we're going back and forth in circles here. I don't quite well, understand. Well, we that's the whole be... point. The whole point is the, uni the future universe will be a safe place because everybody can trust everybody else. We, that is the key. We have to be seen as trusted to trust God. Mm -hmm. And everybody yeah, that's everybody. there is teachable. They've demonstrated that they're teachable, that they will learn and they continue to, to learn. learn. They but do I ever feel like I can be trusted? Yeah. Do I it ever make feel like what I can feel. be trusted? Well, it doesn't it's, make a difference what you feel like. Well, if everybody's trusted back and forth, can I feel like I can trust myself? I don't. There's a lot of people right now that I, are I Christians and they, they don't trust themselves here, around the bars. There. Yeah. No, you know, it's, so it's, yeah, we have to be careful. There's no place in the Bible where it says anything about our judgment being based on feelings. No, I didn't say feelings. You I said, just said trust. I mean, do I don't I know what like I, I would trust, do. I don't feel like I can trust myself. That's a feeling. No, well, no, no, But it no. comes from me. If, I, if I had some circumstances that would make me do something that I've never been into before, mm -hmm. how could I trust myself that I'm going to carry through or not okay well and and this is that's a very fair question and the answer is this those who are on God's side develop so much trust in him that they say God even if I don't see how I'm going to get through this experience I trust you that's exactly what Jesus did in Gethsemane and on Calvary he said I don't see how I can get through this but God father I'm going to trust you okay so you just said you answered there that mm -hmm. it's not trusting ourselves, it's trusting God. And I, th and I think there's another answer to that, uh, that God looks down the corridors of time into the future, and he sees that future as though it were present. And so he knows whether your activities in heaven would be trustworthy or not, and so states. Mm -hmm. And we, because of our relationship with him, say, yes, Lord, we trust you that you're right. What is he seeing when he looks into the future like that? <laughs> you can ask him someday. Yeah. I know, and I know, but, but, <laughs> but you're saying these things, and I'm trying to, trying to put some meaning behind what are they? Well, what, are, what is he seeing? Well, is he, he seeing that we're going to trust him forever, or is, yes, he seeing, yes, yes. is he seeing that we're going to act a certain way forever? He looked down the future of history and said, Job is a man I can trust. And the book of Job proves that. 
Well, you know. So that's what he sees when he looks down the corridor of time. The future of your activities, whatever it is, here on earth or in heaven, he sees it as present. But it is well, you always, you know, you look, you sound like you're asking for a specific event. He's looking for an event that's going to happen. Well, isn't that what you do when you look down through time? You see all, all the is events? It, that's that? the way we think. Is that the way God looks at it? We don't know. And we don't know. Is he looking at our, our ability to trust him? Well, you know, in a garden, mm -hmm. as a gardener, when you plant a seed or when you plant a little plant, like I planted tomatoes. I can look through the corridors of time and see those tomatoes and taste those tomatoes. So maybe God sees the little plant growing in you and says, okay, this one is, is, is doing its, and it's gonna have uh, fruit. And so maybe that's what he sees, but you know. Well, l let's, let's leave that to him, okay? Okay. I, I, I trust that he can do it right. That's right. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How would we answer to a non-Adventist who says that uh, the investigative judgment is a non-biblical knee-jerk reaction to the great disappointment of 1844? Well, of course, you've asked several major questions there, but my response would be a fairly simple one that Norm suggested earlier. At the second, the Bible makes it very clear that at the second coming, well, that some are going to be saved and some are going to be lost. Now we believe, and we could discuss this, but we believe that the righteous are going to be resurrected at the second coming. That's pretty clear. The wicked are not going to be resurrected until the third coming. So before the second coming, God has to decide, or he has to reveal, who he's going to raise and take to heaven and who he's going to leave behind. Because there's no changing after that. So we, whether they like it or not, there has to be a pre-advent judgment of some kind and that's the reason he's doing it. Okay. Now I want to I want to want us to think about some slightly other aspects of this whole thing. One of the scary things about God's judgment is there's no appeal. There's no Supreme Court. There's no appellate court. Why is that? He is the Supreme Court. There doesn't need to be. He's always there. Right. Doesn't need to be because God doesn't make any mistakes the first time. Oh, okay. Okay. And that, let's, uh, we just want to make that clear. Okay? Okay. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has very profitably introduced the idea of purgatory. Very profitably. I noticed that. <laughs> noticed that. So that if someone is, quote, not quite good enough to go to heaven, but not bad enough to go to hell, they go to purgatory. And what happens in purgatory? Ah, you pay enough money, you can pray them out. They, they suffer, but if you pray hard and you give enough money to the church, you can get them out of there quicker, yeah. right? Or maybe if you do it ahead of time, I think one of the trans yeah. Bibles, you can read a certain number of days and you get so many days of indulgences, right. escape from the purgings in uh, purgatory. Can you pay for yourself to yes. get yourself yeah, well, out yeah, of purgatory? Yeah, by reading your Bible. If you know you're going to purgatory? Up to 300 days, I think it is, something like that. They can take it to the promised land. They can't, go it's quantity. Quant <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can read it <laughs> periodically. <laughs> Well, I mean, the point is, let's, let's be clear. Everybody who goes to purgatory eventually gets to heaven. Because you don't work your way from there down. You always work your way from there up, right? That's called universalism, is it not? Well, but they, they, would, they would say some people go straight to hell. Okay. Is the word purgatory in the Bible? No. no so is the concept in the Bible? No. So what was the point of that, bringing that up, as far as what you just said before? Well, I talked about the permanence and the finality of God's judgment. And there are, there are some Christians who say, no, it's not that permanent. There's, a, there's an intermediate category. So I would just... There's a second chance. Second chance. Well, unless they move it to or after purg purgatory, well, then it's... You, you have to equate <laughs> that with the way they look at sin. There's venial sins, menial sins, yeah. and so on. There's grounds well, of sin. And then mentioning second chance, the left behind people say if you're left yeah. behind, you have a second chance also. Yeah, another reason why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no second okay, chance. now we have several more things we need to talk about. So let's, let's keep moving here. Um, when asked about the judgment, some Christians will tell you that they do not fear the judgment because they have a friend in court. And who are they talking about? Jesus. Jesus. And if you ask them, does that mean you don't God is not your friend? Well, how do they respond? 
Well, that's not exactly what I meant, right? So who is our friend in court? Well, if you put Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 together with Romans 8, it makes it very clear that all three members of the Godhead are our friends. They're appealing for us, they're, they're rooting for us, they're working for us. So who is the one that's against us? Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12, right? Yeah, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So we're already talking about the great controversy, aren't we? So we shouldn't be afraid of God judging us, no. but of Satan judging us. Yes. Well, of course, if Satan judges us, you, you know where we would be. There are a couple of passages in Scripture that might make you feel a little uneasy. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. After all this, there's only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey His commands because this is all the human beings, all that human beings were created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. Does that give you a great deal of um, confidence? Don't smile too big. We're wondering what you've been up to. Well, that's, no, that's, that's when you want <laughs> God to grade this. on the curve. <laughs> you hope that God will grade on the curve? Okay, we'll read another passage. You might, someone might say, well, that was written by a tired old king in the Old Testament. Look at Revelation 20. We're cleared down at the end of the Bible. Look at Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened. And then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Isn't that the same message? And then verse 13. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead, death, the dead they held. And all were judged according to what they had done. Okay? Well, somewhere in there we're going to be judged according to what we have done. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? So, Is it, Does that mean that Satan's going to be pointing his finger at us and, and saying, this person did this and this person did that? Especially if you're coming down on God's side. He's going to do everything he possibly can to try to defeat, discourage, you know, He's probably misinform. Talk about record keeping. Yeah. He's probably got the best records of all the nasty things I've done. He'll roll it down the court aisle and <laughs> yeah, look at this list. Right? Look at this list. <laughs> Need I say more? But you have to also equate that. It says very plainly, the devils believe and tremble. Mm -hmm. So I mean, he's he, he's they know he knows the he's got his foot on a hot rock there somewhere too. Mm -hmm. What a powerful being Satan is to get up in front of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and to open his mouth and argue. Yeah. I mean, this no, has... No, that shows you something about God to, to, to let people do that. And to let people talk to him. Yeah. Mm. Well, and so we've talked about friends in court. Who are, who, what kind of people are friends of God? I hope I you know. know anybody? What do you mean by friends? Because no, I, I'm, I, okay, hold say, on. Wait, wait, wait. Say, wait, I'm going to say, I want, I want you to know, I want us to guess. I want, to, I want you to, talk to tell me what kind of people in the Bible were described as friends of God. Moses. Moses. Abraham, Moses. And Job, in a Job, sense. Job said to me right. what was right. Abraham. Abraham three times is called a friend of God. What, what, would be, what about Abraham would, would, would cause God to call him a friend? He spoke correctly yeah. about him, about God. And uh, willing to ask questions. He was willing to question God's judgment look at, reverently. Look, look at Genesis eighteen twenty five. God comes down to this earth with a couple of angels. They, walk al they, they appear as human beings. They're walking along this dusty path. They're pretending they're going to walk right past Abraham's house. And Abraham says, hold it, wait, come in. What's going on? Where did you come from? You know, tell me what, what the news is, etc. And after a while, he discusses, discovers it's actually God that's come to visit him. He feeds him a meal. Then they go out and they look out, stand on the hillside and they look down at the Jordan Valley. And down there is Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot is living. And God says, you know, things are becoming so wicked down there, I have to go and destroy that place. So Abraham starts bargain with, bargaining with He starts with thinking him. about Lot. Yeah, he starts thinking about Lot. Lot's a good guy. He, yeah. must, he must have done some missionary work down there. Right. I wonder how many he has with him. Yeah. 50? Well, maybe How many 40? children does he have? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and he says in, in Genesis 18, 25, Abraham speak, this is Abraham speaking to God. 
Surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. That's impossible. You can't do that. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. This is impossible. The judge of all the earth has to act justly. And the word is righteously. Would you, have you ever prayed like that? God, I think you ought to do what's right. <laughs> right? But this, these, are, these are the people described in the Bible as God's friends. Okay. I've asked God why things are the way they are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Elijah would be another one, wouldn't he? Prob probably. Yeah. Yeah, asking God why things are the way they are is a little different than saying, God, I think you ought to do it right. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about the case of Moses. Do you remember what specifically happened with Moses? Look, look at Exodus 32. Well, they were having a party down there around the... Golden calf. Golden calf. And God says to Moses, I know how stubborn these people are. Now don't try to stop me. I'm angry with them. I'm going to destroy them. Then I'll make you, talking to Moses, I will make you and your descendants into a great nation. And Moses should have said, oh, that would be kind of nice. Now, well, you, well, now, now you got it right, Lord. Yeah, now, <laughs> we're going to have a nation by the name of Moses, right? <laughs> but Moses pleaded with the Lord as God said, Lord, why should you be angry with your people whom you rescued from Egypt with great might and power? Why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of Egypt, planning to kill them in the mountains and destroy them completely? Stop being angry. Change your mind. Do not bring this disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember the solemn promise you made to them to give them as many descendants as there are stars in the sky and to give their descendants all that land you promised would be their possession forever. So the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Now that ought to raise some other questions in our mind. Does God change his mind? Did God change his mind, or did God know that Moses would display that complete trust and, and discuss so why would God, it? Why would God say like, speak to Moses like that? Give him a chance to make that response. He's getting ready to take Moses straight to heaven. Demonstrate to the onlooking universe what Moses was really like. Yeah. yeah. This is his chance to say, okay, folks, watch my friend Moses. Just watch. Does he, is he on my side or isn't he? And here's the way, you know, Moses is not thinking about himself. How many of us, when put in a difficult position, who are we thinking about first? Our I, won't, uh, I won't point any fingers in any direction here. Th thanks. <laughs> By this time, I think he pretty well figured out Moses had changed his outlook on life. Because yeah. in his younger days, he certainly wasn't thinking along those lines. And so many of us as Christians think that somehow we're, we're going to do something that's going to get us into the kingdom of heaven. You know, you, I still have this problem with the friend in court, though. Okay. When you have a friend in court, what does that mean? Because... If a gangster came in and says, hey, I don't have anything to worry about, I got a friend in court here, that means he's going to go in there and his friend's going to do something under the, under the table to make him come back out, you know. But that's one way you can look at it. But when, or you can look at it as a friend in court in that that friend knows that you're innocent type of thing. So, so which, which is one it? is it? <laughs> which is it? Um, if, if your friend in court already knows that you're innocent and he's the judge, why does he even go through the, the judgment? Well, and this is the question. This is the question. Is it the Father is the one that's accusing us, as many Christians believe? And then, so you, then you've got to have Jesus and maybe Mary and a whole bunch of other people pleading for you. And finally God says, well, okay, maybe <laughs> I'm going to let him in. No, do we need that? No. I mean, remember John 16. Maybe we better read those verses. Look at John 16, 25 to 27. Let's just go there for a second. While you're doing that, okay. with respect to the attitude that Moses had, mm -hmm. Desire of Ages 641 has an interesting con uh, concept. Love to man is the outward manifestation of love to God. It was to implant this love to make us children of one family that the King of Glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, 
when we love the world as he loved it, then for us his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. And the reference? Desire of Ages 641, paragraph 3. Okay. But that's what Moses was demonstrating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, look at what Jesus himself said. Now, many people have a very hard time with these verses because it seems to undo almost everything in the Old Testament. John 16, verse 25. Now we're down to the last few minutes that Jesus has with his disciples before Gethsemane and Calvary, etc. Jesus says, I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, would you like to hear some words from Jesus telling you specifically and plainly what God is like? Oh, yes. I mean, wouldn't that be really important to know? When that day comes, Jesus says, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Why? For the Father himself loves you. He's saying, I don't need to intercede with you. I don't need to pray on your behalf. I don't need to plead with God for you. Now, I need to deal with the devil and his accusations. But this other stuff, no. I don't need to do that. Well, now we need to get to our verses here real quick in the last few minutes we have. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3, we read about peace and safety. In Paul's day, what was the peace and safety cry? Anybody? Pax Romana. The Pax Romana, yeah, we know about the Pax Romana. The Romans said, if you just pay your taxes and behave yourself, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep peace in the whole world, right? It was a theme of the Roman government. Um, and look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. Paul is reassuring the Thessalonians that they were not supposed to be in the dark. We should probably just look at that real quick. But you, brothers and sisters, are not here. Sisters are included, notice. This is a gender-inclusive Bible. Are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So that should be very clear, okay? That peace and safety message, is that, a, is that a message that governments are saying to each other? Or is this a secular thing? Or is this a spiritual thing? Probably both. At least spiritual in one sense. Uh, Councils to Writers, 102. All who shall unite in praise and honor and glorify those who have lifted the banner of Satan are fighting against God. Our work now is to enlighten the world in the, in the place of a bearing a peace and safety message. A banner has been placed in our hands upon which is inscribed, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is a distinct, separating message, a message that is to give no uncertain sound. Yep. So, Popular ministers, when you, when you bring to them a message that says, here is what God has, is saying, they say, ah, oh, don't, don't get too worried about that. Let's, uh, everything's going to go just fine. You, you don't want to be in the popular evangelical or evangelistic, whichever you choose to say, call it, side when Revelation 13 comes along. Exactly. And Satan is evangelizing the whole world. That's right. Yeah. Well, so we're not supposed to be in the dark. Paul and others have tried to prepare us in every possible way for the events that are going to lead up to the final events of this world. And furthermore, what did Jesus himself say? Didn't he say, I am the light of the world? Yes. So if we're on Jesus' side, are we supposed to be walking around in darkness? Well, there are a lot of people who believe that when God speaks, the thunder rolls, you know, and there's all, all terrible things being said. The Holy Spirit, as a member of the Godhead, prefers to speak to us in, my version calls it, the soft whisper of a voice. You remember the story of Elijah, how there was a wind, the earthquake, and the fire there at the mouth of the cave on mm -hmm. Mount Sinai. And finally, God was not in any of those things, but finally there's the soft whisper of a voice. And what did God say to Elijah? What are you doing here? But the question for us is, in the 
in the age of internet, television, movies, gossip, everything else that's going on, I mean, there are so many distractions in our world, it's just unbelievable. Do we, can we really hear the soft whisper of God's voice? This, this, this requires some focusing of the attention. Well, and look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 to 8. So then we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. Christians are supposed to be hyper-vigilant. The guards who stay awake at the army post at night, they're not supposed to be, uh, uh, can I keep one eye open? No, they're supposed to be wide awake, right? Because if, they, if, if they're not, the whole place is at risk, right? It is at night that people sleep. It is at night that people get drunk. But we belong to the day and we should be sober. We must wear faith and love as a breastplate and our hope of salvation as a helmet. By the way, notice that here he's already talking about faith, hope, and love. Those are the things he talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, aren't they? God did not choose us to suffer his anger, but to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us in order that we might live together with him, whether we are alive or dead, when he comes. And so encourage one another, help one another, just as you are now doing. So that's the end of our passage for the day. And there's several things more I wanted to talk about, which we didn't really have a time to talk about. God's wrath. What do we know about God's wrath? Well. There are a couple of passages. If you want to really read some details about God's wrath, go to our website, www.theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Go to the teacher's guide for the book of Judges and look at number nine. And go to the teacher's guide for the book of Hosea and look at number 13. And you'll see a lot of information. In effect, I would like to summarize it for you in the last few seconds we have. God's wrath as defined by the Bible. This is not Webster or some modern dictionary here. As defined by the Bible, God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. You don't want that to happen to you. I certainly don't want that to happen to me. We need to be awake, we need to be sober, we need to be listening for God's voice. See you next week.